think we did a tech check on this thing and, and everything was okay. And uh, now it wasn't. It's, okay, great. It's always, it's always the case, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So let me start up. I had to, for some reason, I had to restart my machine. Uh, I just did that uh, just before the uh, presentation started. So I'm just going to bring up the portal that I'm going to show you real quick. So we're ready to go. Yeah. Okay, good. Now you can hear me fine and you can see me. Yeah, both very good. <laughs> oh, good, good. I'm so sorry that there was some sort of a technical glitch here. Um, we will get going immediately to see if we can make up for lost time. Uh, appreciate you guys hanging around for a minute. Um, I'm sitting over here in Sweden in Malmo and it's evening time over here. And um, well, I guess I'm, I'm good to go. We're going to talk about application development at large scale today. Uh, the stuff you want to do, really, is deliver services and features. That's what you want to build, and that's what you want your customers to benefit from, whether they are uh, public customers or private secret customers internally. You build stuff, and you want people to be able to use it. Now, the stuff that comes with that is a lot of other things. All of the things to the right in this list are you know, other concerns that you really don't want to be bothered with, but you kind of have to do them. You have to make sure that everything is working and it's scaling and it's available and all of those things. Um, another way to put it is, is this. Uh, nice question there at the top. Are you ready to go to uh, deploy to production? Well, there are all these things, right? And uh, whenever anyone shows you a long list like this with a lot of bullet points and small font, Here's a tip. They don't actually want you to remember all the details of this list because it's a pointless list. What I want you to take away from this slide is that there is a lot. There is a lot to figure out, a lot to handle, and a lot to manage in order to actually go to production with something. So the service fabric by Microsoft then is created to sort of get a handle on that, to um, make it easier for you to do all these things. And what is the service fabric then? Uh, well, the definition says that the service fabric is a distributed systems platform that makes it easy to build scalable, reliable, low latency, and easily managed applications for the cloud. OK. What does that mean? Good question. Well, it means that you can focus on your business needs and let the service fabric take care of ensuring your application is always available and scales. So you focus on your business and the service fabric distributed systems platform thingy does its magic and you don't have to bother with a lot of stuff. That's basically it. Now, audience, I can see there are a lot of people in the audience. Um, I wanted to call out, see if we can do like raising hands and things. Um, but I don't know that I can see the raising hands thingy control. Hmm. Maybe you guys can help me, uh, organizers. Where is the raising hand thingy? Um, uh, this. Agnes, no, maybe we are full organizer now. We have questions here. Oh, questions. Yeah. Oh, right. Um, so, but there's a. You're supposed to be able to raise the hand, right? Ah, there it is. Ah, now I can see raising hands. Lovely. Um, so, have anyone in the audience, have you seen um, or sort of gone into uh, taking a look at service fabric at all? That's a good, that's a good question. Well, there's one, possibly. Um, right, but, but to answer a negative, let's see if we can answer a, a positive question. Um, Let's do, let's do uh, one that, where one is 50-50. Do you consider yourselves to be primarily a developer? Raise your hand, please. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. So obviously then if I, if I ask the other question, would you consider yourself to be primarily an IT pro? Um, how many people's hands do I get? Uh, 
Uh, okay. A uh, few hands there. Good. Um, and the, the final question, uh, I don't really know where the raising my hands button is. <laughs> Sorry, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, that's going to be difficult to answer, right? All right. Um, it, is a it is a little bit more difficult to um, talk to an audience that, which is online. And uh, if you have any questions, you should feel free to, to try to, to ask these questions in the asking question window. And we'll see what we can do to, um, to accommodate your questions if you have any. But uh, I can see that we have a mixed bag of, of IT pros and developers, uh, or at least people who consider themselves to be either or in the room. And that's great. Um, so this, is, this should be a, a nice overview session for, about uh, service fabric for you guys. So, who am I talking? Well, uh, I think it's time I, I said my name myself here. It's uh, Magnus Martinson here, and I am a regional director, a Microsoft regional director in Sweden. That means that I'm a close partner to Microsoft, uh, not that I'm employ employed by Microsoft. I'm also an Azure MVP, and as an Azure MVP, I am um, focused on Azure uh, uh, all the time, and, and I, I do my work on this platform. When I saw this, I saw your integration user group uh, map there of the world, uh, where you guys are from. That was kind of impressive and, and kind of cool. And it reminded me a little bit about this, which is the Global Azure Bootcamp uh, map. Now, uh, have any of you attendees visited a um, Global Azure Bootcamp or participated or organized one? If there are any, any hands going up now, I'm going to be happy. See how many people are still raising hands at all. Seems to be a few who are, yes, have, have knowledge of what the Global Azure Bootcamp is. So the Global Azure Bootcamp is the, a community project that I'm working on that I really love, and I, I urge you guys, I'm going to send you the URL in a second, uh, to uh, participate in this for the next year here. Uh, this was uh, 2015. We were about well, almost 200, something like 186 locations in the world that participated in this huge global bootcamp event. And it was all about Azure. So every local community organized the day of Azure, and we all did it on the same day using this global Azure hashtag that you can see on screen. And this was the third time we did this huge event, and you guys really should uh, browse to global.azurebootcamp.net and register uh, as a user on our website, which will give you information on when we will have the next Global Azure Bootcamp. It's a very, very, very fun and, and global, fantastic event, really. One more thing I'm going to call out before we continue with Service Fabric is a conference coming up in uh, about a month, uh, less than a month now, called Cloudburst. Uh, this is a uh, conference in Stockholm physically you can attend. It's uh, free to attend but you can also watch this conference online because we will be live streaming. And it's a great conference with really, really good speakers. Before I rebooted my screen, I actually had a list of the speakers on screen. Uh, and see if we can get that back up. There we go. So these people who are speaking about these topics are really, really great MVPs and, and uh, other folks that are, are speaking at our conference, some uh, program managers from Microsoft, etc. That's a really good place to go if you want to learn more about Azure. All right, that was that for intros. Let's go back to the service fabric and stay there for the duration of this session. The um, App platform, if you say generally app platform that you have today where you can deploy and run your applications, basically you'll plop your apps and services on top of this, this stack, this platform that Microsoft offers. They have this huge Visual Studio block that everybody probably knows about, and you can run and host your applications in different forms on the uh, app platform. You can either uh, build simple or not simple, but um, stuff that is really uncomplicated to build because it's running as, as, as a platform, as a service service, or you can host and run your own uh, virtual machines uh, down here and you can see the IaaS layer. And 
I, I wanted to show you this picture is kind of just an overview picture. I wanted to show you that this is where Microsoft places the Azure app service app, the Azure service fabric, right there in the middle, uh, together closely with the cloud services offering that they have. Um, so I was wondering, um, has anyone ever used or deployed a cloud service application in Azure? Let's see, only one. There's only uh, two, three, four. Yeah, there are some people who have used the cloud services. They're really good, and um, I, I love them. And that's where, where Microsoft started with the cloud. They started with the cloud services offering, and then they added the virtual machines, the Azure virtual machines, and the websites service, which is now more uh, connected together in what was called the app service. What Microsoft haven't been showing is this Azure service fabric piece. They haven't showed us that that thing existed. And uh, it's been around for quite a while, so this is nothing new really at all. What's new is that Microsoft is starting to let us see it. Uh, Microsoft themselves have built quite a few large services on top of the service fabric. Uh, things like the SQL database, for instance, uh, Azure SQL database is built on top of the service fabric. Uh, the born in the cloud, built for the cloud service called the document DB is absolutely on top of the, the service fabric. And so on and so forth. Bing Cortana is one of the biggest services they run on the service fabric. It actually runs uh, in a huge cluster uh, running on three data centers. And according to legend, uh, Bing Cortana has even survived a partial data, data uh, data center outage uh, and still been able to service requests. So you can build really, really big systems with service fabric. You can also scale it down to reasonably small. And there are some other great advantages to service fabric, which we will see in a, in a minute. But I guess you guys know and have heard about a lot of these, uh, a lot of these services. You being integration guys, event hubs probably is, is stuff that you like a lot. Um, well, anyway, as you can see, this is nothing new. This is just uh, a really cool service that Microsoft has hidden from the world and used themselves and matured and build, built internally, which we will now be starting to, to gain access for, to, uh, to more and more. All right, so far so good. I've, I've sort of given a, given a teaser on where we are, right, with this service fabric thing. But before we can start really to dig into the service fabric from Microsoft, uh, we kind of need to take a step back and, and figure out what a microservice really is. I'm going to step through this quite quickly. It's more of a story and not so much as, you know, you need to read and, and see and remember everything on every slide in this section. So a microservice is kind of something like it's there, there's some kind of application logic and there's a bit of state that you can version, you can deploy, you can scale it. It has a unique name, so you can sort of reference the microservice. Uh, it's, it's got a unique namespace somewhere. And you can also use a microservice to interact with other well-defined uh, interfaces and other microservices using standard protocols like REST. Here's a good example on that. Uh, the SQL database uh, service that I showed you on the previous slide there. SQL database is built of, they, they won't tell me exactly, but it's like a handful or maybe 10 or something microservices that, that together make up this service that we know as the SQL database service. We see a SQL database service. In fact, underneath it's several microservices and micro doesn't necessarily mean really small. Like for instance, if you provision a new SQL database, there is this whole microservice thing that does nothing but handle the provisioning part, creating new service uh, databases. That's very separate. That's a lot separate from actually running a database. So you can see logically one microservice would be create a new database and one uh, microservice would be run a database. And I guess there's, like I said, there's, there are some, there's a few more. But there, that's just an example to, to sort of explain what I mean by this, that you can have microservices uh, orchestrated together to form a, a bigger service, like an application or something that you need or use. 
So the cool thing about a microservice conceptually, and I'm not talking about a specific technology or solution, but conceptually is that it is logically consistent always, even if there is something that goes wrong in the service, it still is supposed to be logically consistent. And you host this thing in, inside of something called a container. You take the code of your application, the configuration of your con uh, application, and then you deploy it, deploy your microservice to some sort of container host that runs it. And uh, typically, a very small team will build these services. And uh, talking about technology I mentioned just now, a microservice is basically whatever you want it to be. It can be built using anything, really. It all, all, all we need is that the microservice is capable of running inside of the host. And uh, Microsoft is building support for a lot of versions of microservices so that you basically should be able to bring just about any application that you have built and host it inside of this this, this service fabric world. When you're talking about microservices, if you ask Microsoft, there are two kinds of microservices. You have your stateless microservices and you have your stateful microservices. Let's take them in turn, starting with the stateless. Now, this is the stuff that we have always known really uh, about the cloud, is that you're supposed to be stateless, right? You run a service, and then that service, instances of that service, have their state persisted to some other storage. For instance, an Azure database, or Azure storage, or an Azure table, or using Azure queues, or things like that. That's how we've been taught to build services. You can't have stateful services because that, that won't work. That's basically the, the lesson we've been lear learned and the, the architecture we've been following. And you can have mul multiple instances. This is typically a web front end. That's a classic stateless microservice, uh, if you will, or a classic stateless service that you can then deploy as a microservice. You have a web front end, you deploy it to a bunch of instances, and the state, whatever state, like session state and things like that, that's persisted somewhere else. Now, a stateful microservice, inversely, the opposite, the stateful microservice is uh, a service that has state, and it has state on the local instances, and that, that state is replicated and, and persisted in, in sort of in the memory or on the machines uh, that you are running the service on. This is exactly how SQL Database runs. Um, those of you who know that SQL Database uh, has this replication thing happening underneath the covers that commits any transaction you do to the database on three separate instances, and that's exactly this thing. You have multiple replicas, and they are kept uh, underneath your, the surface of your service. They are kept in sync all the time. So if one of those would blow up, if something goes wrong in the data center, and one, one, service, one rack of servers goes powerless, you still have your other replicas available, and you won't ever lose any data, etc. And the, the really, really powerful thing here, when you think about it, is that you have your state on your instances. You don't have to go somewhere else and fetch the state. Even if that's close by, even if there's a really, really fast network, you still have some other where, place to go and fetch your state. And with the stateful microservice, you don't, because it's on the instance that you're running. So when you, you make a request to that, it's going to have its state immediately. So obviously that's going to be faster. Now, also really, really cool is that you get a, a big reduction in complexity, and I will show you right away uh, with this picture. Your know, classic three-tier service pattern, you have your load balancer and your front-end stateless web application, right, which can scale out a lot. And then behind the, the scenes there, you have another middle-tier compute state, uh, stateless application uh, uh, machines instances that do heavy lifting and computing and stuff. Well, again, you would need your, your partition, you, you would need your storage and then you would scale using a partition storage so that you can have multiple databases or something that service your middle tier compute state. Um, 
to, to service the state back to your, your compute and, and also to your front end. But, all right, now you want to be really reliable here and uh, make sure you can commit data, uh, commit requests somewhere. So you might be starting to use a picture that looks something like this, where you start to, to leverage queues to uh, build uh, your, your service. You make a front-end request into a queue, and the middle tier will compute something, and when the middle tier is done, you will, get a, a, you will be able to fetch the results into, into your web uh, application again. But as I said, the um, latency thingy for the reads uh, is, is, is still annoying because you have to go and fetch data from storage, so you might go in and add your caching layer in the picture to have some caching in your, your uh, application as well so that you can get really quick reads uh, on things that you need to read really fast. Hmm, serves a lot of requests with, right? All right, but then you also get this transaction thing that you need to do. You need to create some sort of model to handle your own internal transaction management system and people start building queues to do that and make sure you get get worker queues and stuff like that. So it's really beginning to become a rather complex picture. And there are many moving parts to this application, if you will, right? This is a service or an application, and it has a lot of moving parts and a lot of pieces that you have to think about and handle and manage. And you can build huge, I mean, don't get me wrong, you can build huge systems with this. This is really, really powerful stuff. You can build stuff that can manage super many uh, requests that can do massive amounts of compute and they can be really quick. Still, there's a lot of stuff to, to, to be concerned with here. Now compare this to a, a, a stateful services design, if you will. Well, what do you have? You still might have your, your stateless uh, front-end websites, of course, but then you have your stateful middle-tier compute. Your stateful middle-tier compute. What does that mean? Well, it means that you can do your low latency reads on this because the state is already inside of the middle tier. The state is right in here, so you can, whenever you make a read, it's serviced really, really quickly back. And you can partition uh, this and scale out as a first class citizen because whenever you scale out and get more instances, the only thing that will happen is that this this replication of state will, will go to uh, more instances of machines. Right? I mean, there is a bit of an overhead. There's always going to be some overhead, but, but overall, you will have many more machines running your service. Like, for instance, again, I, I keep going back to SQL database, but something along the lines of 1.4 million databases is pretty powerful stuff. So you can build really large things with this. And um, one other cool thing is that you have transactions built into this. So if you start a transaction here and you run something transactionally, against your state. Uh, you, can, you can manage to do that really easily without having to, to uh, resort to using some complicated queuing mechanism or, or something else. So as you can see, there are a lot fewer moving parts in this picture, really. And then, of course, you would use data stores to do analytics and disaster recovery and those sort of things anyway. Uh, but but that's uh, sort of just for backup in this scenario. So if you compare this picture to the core picture, this is a lot simpler, really, because the stateful middle tier thing is much more powerful. So we have come to sort of this complicated, I have a few Microsoft slides you can tell, right? This is typically a Microsoft slide trying to show everything at one time. Now. A service fabric application or an application deployed in the service fabric can run in many different environments. You can run them in Azure, of course. I will show you this in a while uh, that you can run, that I have a cluster uh, of service fabric uh, compute running in Azure. I can run in private clouds, uh, Windows Server, Linux, and I can run on, on hosted clouds. So potentially I could deploy the service fabric to another cloud. I couldn't, not necessarily only to the Azure cloud, but Service Fabric itself doesn't specifically tie into Azure, if, if we put it that way. 
And that's kind of powerful because that also enables it to run on my local machine, which I will show in a second, or in a while anyway. All right, so that's, that's really cool that you have this freedom of hosting options here. Of course, Microsoft will want you to run them in Azure, and uh, that would make a ton of sense, but you don't have to. You can run them on your private cloud uh, infrastructure that you have in your offices. All right, so Service Fabric has a bunch of things in it. That's the other part of this picture, right? Your microservice is running on top of this Service Fabric, but it contains a lot of stuff. All of these things are things that you don't have to build, you don't have to maintain, you don't have to handle, you don't have to manage, nothing. All of this stuff is built once inside of this service fabric. And uh, Microsoft have solved, if you will, and that's kind of a loaded term in this context, but have kind of solved the problem. They have created a system which is robust, which scales, which is you know, phenomenally uh, powerful and and uh, all of these things are things that you don't have to build and maintain. Like you could probably build, and if you could build it, Microsoft, chances are Microsoft will want to hire you or something. But uh, really, it, it is a powerful thing that you can uh, not spend your time on by just using the service fabric. If we sort of try to box it up, it starts to look something like this. And I want to talk first about the low-level systems, really, uh, the federation and transport subsystems down here uh, on the lower part of the screen. Uh, these uh, pieces are what makes this thing tick, uh, really. Uh, you can use the transport subsystem, they use TCP and stuff underneath there to communicate from, from instance to instance in your, in your uh, cluster. And uh, also the, um, the federation subsystem, uh, detects failures and stuff, and um, and and handles things on on a sort of a cluster level that you don't want to really know about. If you understand what I mean, you just want things to run. You don't really care how. You just want to build microservices on top of a system which allows things to just run. So low low level, this is uh, those two systems handle this. Uh, if we sort of contrast or compared to a typical data center, you would have your racks. You would have your physical and your virtual machines in a bunch of racks. If you take Azure, you might, in the data, data center, you might have tens or maybe even hundreds of thousands of, of physical machines, certainly hundreds of thousands of virtual machines in a, a typical data center. Now, when you create a cluster, you, cr you join a bunch of these, uh, a set of these machines together so that you get this uh, cluster of, of nodes that form a service fabric environment for you. And, and these can scale to you know, thousands of machines if you need to. But you can also run them on a few machines. Here's another layout um, that I want to show you just how to do placement and failover of applications inside of a system like this. Now, uh, I told you before that SQL database has three replicas of, of any database that you build. Say that you have something that looks like this. You have an application, the red application here. It has a primary node and some replicas, secondaries, active secondaries, and there's continuous syncing among these machines, right? Let's add another application, a blue one, and then a green one, and then a, an orange, I suppose, kind of an orange one, and then a, a silver one. Now, all of these applications are automatically deployed to the cluster. When you deploy, you say, I want to have a primary and a, a, some, some secondaries. And you just say deploy. You don't exactly know where inside of the, the nodes, uh, unless you go and check it out. But normally, you don't care where inside of the, the nodes that make up your cluster that your machine, that your application is running. You just know that it does, and, and you have, have a designated exactly how much power you want your, machine, your, your service to have at this given moment. And, uh, oh, I guess we have a failure here, right? A node went down. So node 103 just died. And as you can see, the green primary and a couple of secondaries are located on this machine. So now we have a failure in the system. The first thing that happens down on this, this low-level layer is that the uh, the uh, system corrects itself and ties itself together again and, and so that your cluster is whole. 
And then it starts checking. Well, what do we have? Well, we're now missing a primary on the green service. That's the most critical part, so let's fix that. Immediately um, have a, a, an election and uh, create or, or sort of promote a secondary to a primary so that the uh, green system is now fully functional again and has its designated primary. And then, of course, we need to add those uh, missing secondaries. Uh, so we'll go and, and uh, complete the system again by, by adding up uh, some more secondaries uh, to, to uh, copying up, really. You, you make a duplicate of, of a secondary that you already have, and you connect them together again. So that's basically how, I mean, as an overview picture, I think this is kind of clear still. It just shows how this happens. What, what is it that happens underneath the covers when something goes wrong that makes this thing resilient and robust? And as you can see here in this sort of faked sample uh, that we didn't lose any data anywhere uh, in, this, uh, in this crash where the node disappeared, really. We can just go ahead and continue as if nothing happened. We talked about reads being quick. Well, typically a read would, would be serviced straight from the primary in a system like this. So you, it has the state already on the, on the box. And whenever somebody reads, it just services the requests immediately. It doesn't have to go to a SQL database or anywhere else to, to fetch the state. It just responds. Now, Writes are, are kind of a little bit more complex, uh, and in a service fabric system, what you would write to the primary, and that will write to the secondaries, and the secondaries would acknowledge uh, when enough secondaries, uh, a, a right quorum of secondaries have responded, you will get your response saying, okay, right, your write is completed. And then there was one slow guy uh, that comes in late and acknowledges and, and catches up with the rest, but you don't have to wait for the, the stragglers in the system. You can return when you have enough uh, writes uh, confirmed. Now, if the primary should fail, as I said, I'll just click through this quick, you will promote a secondary. If a secondary fails, you'll just go and say, yeah, whatever. Um, and then uh, the, the primary, the old primary comes back and says, hey, I'm back again. Well, then the new primary says, well, sorry, you're, not, you're now not the primary anymore, so you can go and be a secondary, and I'll catch you up to what's happened you know, in the meantime while you were snoozing or something. And then we can also build a new secondary to, to replace the lost secondary there. Uh, there's some, pri some prioritization and, and just automatic management and stuff happening underneath the, the covers. Now, to build this system would be kind of complex. It's not a simple thing to build. And um, it's kind of interesting that, that you can build it, and it's even more cool that just to realize that you don't have to. Uh, Microsoft built it. It's uh, the service fabric, and you can just use it instead and focus on your business. All right, cool. So let's talk about programming a little bit. I'm not going to spend all my time here, but I do have a little bit of demo code to show at least, and hopefully I'll be able to deploy to my local machine. I say hopefully because, well, uh, this is preview stuff uh, that I have installed, uh, some preview bits that I have, and I've already uh, and, and I've installed a new operating system. I have have Windows 10 now, and I have uh, Visual Studio 2015 on my box, and all these things that are well, kind of new. Um, are not really used to, to hanging together. So we'll see what happens when I try to demo. Hopefully, I, I can show you code. Hopefully, I will be able to show you stuff that actually runs. All right, so the um, APIs that you will use to uh, interact with the service fabric are two main APIs called the Reliable, Reliable Services API and the Reliable Actors API. All right, so the Reliable Services API and Actor API the first one, the Reliable Services API, is a way to build stateless services using existing technologies. You can, use, uh, you can build an ASP.NET service, you can build a, um, a web server service or whatever you like, uh, a web API or something can be your, your microservice, works perfectly fine. You can also build these stateful services that we've been talking about using something called Reliable Collections. I will show you what that is in a second. Uh, and, and um, you can 
also I also said that you have transactions built in, right? You can um, um, just utilize transactions in your services. I will show you code for this, uh, and uh, uh, you can see what I mean. And then you can use whatever web APIs or VCF communication technology that you would like to use. So it, can, it can be anything that you're used to, really. Uh, it's, it's literally the two in the middle that are, are great to, if you want to use stateful stuff and, and transactions uh, that, that are sort of different from what you're used to. Uh, and and uh, I mentioned something called reliable collections. Now, what are those? Well, collections way back when, in the olden days, uh, were something that you could run on a single machine and you could run them single-threaded. That sort of evolved, evolution took it to concurrent collections where you could uh, interact with them over multiple threads on a single machine still. Now, uh, it kind of makes sense that the next step is to break free of that single machine um, problem or, or limitation and go to a multi-machine scenario. Reliable collections are reliable across multiple machines and they are replicated automatically, high available, they are durable, they can use asynchronous uh, communication and, and also they support transactions. So reliable collections are really, you know, .NET collections evolution for the cloud and, and really on steroids, if you will. So these, um, again, these things have transactions, they are replicated, and uh, reads are repeatable within your transaction, which is probably very useful. Uh, and um, I'm going to show you some code that, that shows this. Um, I have to go and open up my my uh, projects again because of my reboot I have to go and and open up my projects. Let me in fact open up another project while I'm doing that so that we won't have to wait later. Um, first of all, if you go into Visual Studio, I have a blank Visual Studio here, and you have installed the, the Azure tooling and that's that, those things you will have a new file new project experience here. In fact, I was going to show you that I have a file new demo, yay! Um, you have a file new service experience in here that you can say click, you can click on cloud service fabric and you can create yourself a service fabric application. Now, if we do that, we will have options to create a stateless service, stateless actor service, or a stateful service, or a stateful actor service, or maybe just an ASP.NET 5 web service. These are five kinds of, <coughs> of templates that you can choose from right now. There will be more templates to, to come uh, in the future. But when you create one of these, you will end up with something that looks like this. I wonder if zooming works. Do you guys know if zooming works on this? system? That's a good question. I probably shouldn't be zooming. Uh, um, the um, stateful service that I uh, have uh, created, this, this sort of file new experience, has this stateful application project. And it's really almost empty. It has an application manifest that points to my application, and it has uh, a few PowerShell scripts that lets you deploy and, and uh, uh, you know, read your status of your application, those sort of things using PowerShell. This is sort of a PowerShell world at this time because these are preview things, uh, but, but it's kind of interesting uh, to see that this stateful application is just really, um, it's, it's a box, it's a collection that collects your, your microservices and lets you deploy them or package them up and deploy them as a unit, really. I have this Hello World stateful service here. Now, what I want to show you here is in the references. I hope this, this has good, good enough resolution. But in here it says System Fabric and Microsoft Service Fabric and things like that. In fact, if I go and hit Find, and Find is on my other screen, if I go and hit Find <laughs> on this screen um, and, and type Azure, 
in here, and I try to find all instances of Azure inside of my solution, see that there are none. Nothing in here talks about Azure. As I said before, you can deploy Service Fabric applications to other places than in the cloud. Now, deploying them in the cloud is great, but it, again, Service Fabric doesn't have anything to do with the cloud. So this is typically, uh, really, if you click on the program, um, pro program file here, you'll see that it has a program which has a main. So this is, looks like a console application to me. And inside of the console application, I say I want to have a fabric runtime. Just get me a fabric runtime, please. And then I just register a type. And the type here is the, uh, the application type that I want to run. And in this case, it's a stateful service that I want to run. That's really all I'm doing. So going into this stateful service, you can see that it, it inherits indeed from th something called stateful service. Uh, and this stateful service uh, has a uh, run async method uh, that, that, you, that gets called for on when this uh, application is invoked or instantiated. The thing I wanted to call out in here in the, in the reliable uh, stateful service was these, uh, uh, this reliable collect collection, in this case a reliable dictionary here that I say uh, I want to use, a reliable dictionary of custom objects. This is used for a uh, word counting scenario, so you can do uh, a, a state of word counts on your machine, and uh, you will call into your state manager on your stateful service, and you would get your specific instance of this dictionary. And uh, when you want to interact with this stuff, uh, what you would do is go to your state manager again and you would get a transaction. This transaction scope here, inside of this using statement, is you could in interact with multiple different dictionaries or queues or st uh, whatever you want in here uh, that are in this stateful service. And that would all be transactionally sound. And then you would go and commit your, your transaction when you're, when you're done. So as you can see, you have stateful services, uh, stateful dictionaries and things like that in queues, and you can use transactions inside of your application just by, by using the uh, Service Fabric uh, API, the, 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 reliable, uh, uh, the, the reliable service API. I'm not going to run that, um, that example. I am going to try to run the uh, actor version, which comes here. The um, Reliable Actor API, the other API, is uh, you can, uh, a way for you to build stateless and stateful objects uh, with a virtual actor programming model. And what that means is that if you have a scenario where you have lots of little things that you want to keep track of that have some state, um, a really, really good example is Halo, the game Halo that use uh, 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 this virtual actor system to um, uh, keep the state, to maintain the state of all the players that play Halo, for instance, and, and a bunch of other things. So when you have lots of little independent units of state and you want to do lots of little independent computes, then you can use the actor model instead of the services model. And um, it's really, really, really good when you have uh, a bunch of, of small or millions even of small actors like players of Halo, for instance. All right, and uh, in your actor programming model, you would define your actors. You would say, I would like to have an actor, and then you would uh, create, you would implement those interfaces of your actor, and you would register your types and say that these are the actors that exist. And then you would connect to the actor uh, using this actor proxy model. You would create your, your actor, and then you can interact with it. I'm going to show you a really trivial thing. So I'm, I hope you excuse that it's kind of trivial or a lot trivial. But I want to show you something simple that, that explains this still and, and, and still is you know, decently understandable. So we don't have to spend a lot of time understanding how this thing works. All right, so I have here a, um, uh, a demo application which will uh, deploy to my, my service fabric. 
and I will, for the first time, I will show you the service fabric running locally on my box here. Uh, unfortunately, again, I have to restart every program that I have here. Um, here uh, I have a local cluster on my local machine and I'm using a, a, a tool called the Service Fabric Explorer. You get this tool when you install Service Fabric on your local machine. And in this local cluster that I'm running, uh, I am running five nodes, five nodes of, of uh, a, a, a cluster, a Service Fabric cluster running on my machine right now, uh, local on my machine, and I can deploy to it simply by, hit, by hitting F5 here inside of my application. So we're going to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> might take a while or a little moment. But what happens when I hit F5 inside of Visual Studio is that this service fabric um, deployment happens. I'm also going to go and find my client application so I think we have a deployment and I will just put my demo application in its rightful place uh, off this to, on my second screen all right, so here we have something deploying. As again, as you can see, it takes a while and it's running, it's actually running some, some PowerShell scripts here to deploy to the service fabric locally on my machine. And, and it usually doesn't, it didn't take this long uh, when I had my other in, uh, installation. It's taking a little bit longer here. <laughs> it's actually too long for Visual Studio to actually deploy. And I don't know why that is, but um, hopefully we'll have the application up. Um, you can see there it's red here uh, and it's because it's taking time to actually start up. Um, when I drill into this actor counter demo application type, which is my application, you can see here that it has one node ready and it's supposed to go up to three nodes of, of running my code. Uh, it seems to be very slow, but maybe, maybe, just maybe it's running now, we'll see. Um, right. There's some bit of refresh that you have to do in order for this to, this tool to respond. It's a, it's a really good tool, but it, it can certainly be improved. Uh, and Microsoft is working on, on improvements. They know about these things, the refresh annoyances. Uh, ah, now it seems to be green. Well, it still just says one node. Well, there is certainly something is wrong there. Uh, it says that it's running my, uh, on just one node, and that's, that's not correct. So unfortunately, if this doesn't work, we'll have to just continue as if nothing happened. All right, that might be the case. Um, right. So anyway, what you saw was that the application did deploy to my to my uh, local cluster. Maybe not completely working as it should, because then it would not say just one instance here. It would actually say several instances. One thing that I can point out while we're looking at this is that any, everything else inside of this fabric, uh, the fabric control systems, are, are also running inside of the fabric itself. So if I drill into system here, you can see that there are some failover and clustering services and image store services and stuff running. And these are themselves microservices running in the service fabric. The, the systems that control the fabric are running inside of the, the fabric which is really cool, and uh, this is uh, the reason you can, you can deploy this local cluster or this, you can deploy the service fabric to a cluster of anything really, uh, Windows servers in Azure or, or Windows servers in your local uh, environment or hopefully usually even in your local uh, 
in your local uh, environment. See what happens if I try to run my client application against this thing. Well, that works, which is good. Uh, this is a stupid, stupid counter application that I have deployed. It's, it's very, very trivial. It keeps counting. That's what it does. And what I wanted to show was that I was able to um, knock this thing over and still have it run. That might not be the case now uh, because of this. Uh, it seems like it looks like it only has one node running my code, but that's not usually the case again. Um, final thing, final time I'll check to see. Well, it says it just has one node. Uh, probably the demo won't work here uh, because what I usually do at this point is that I go down to the node that's running the code and I would go to the primary and I would go down to the code package which is running there on top of that thing and I would just say, I'll restart it. That's this code. I will stop it and restart it. And that's it. That's nothing you can do about it. Uh, and uh, what happens here, let's see, something is actually clicking there. Well, something did break. Uh, and it's not supposed to break in this way. But it is keep. it does keep counting. So something is, is uh, half working in this scenario. We'll have to stop this demo now. And I will go and show you the code instead. Unfortunately, it's not working properly uh, at this time. Uh, what I am doing, and the reason I, I am having some, some issues believing that this is actually working the way it should, is that I am really not, I'm really ho holding local state on my instance. So it really should have restarted the counting uh, because of this local state when I, I uh, knocked the application over. Uh, cool thing is that the application does boot up again because the service fabric knows how many instances and how many replicas and things uh, you should be uh, using at, at, at this time. So if I knock an instance over, it's going to immediately start a new one. And that's cool in its own right. But it should have restarted the, ca the counting. Uh, maybe it was that I somehow collided with an old deployment that I had. Because what I wanted to do now is I wanted to go from the stateful actor here um, into a into a or the into a stateless actor, uh, and um, in order to do this, I would use a um, another actor base class, uh, the actor of T, which would then be able to have uh, its state. Uh, in this case, this little stupid class here called a counter state, which would hold the count in the, uh, in the uh, service fabric uh, state, stateful store. Uh, um, if I remove my local state here, you will see that my code then fails. So what I would do now if I have a, a stateful actor is that I would say state dot count, the count inside of my state. And if I build this application and deploy it instead, We'll try one more deploy deployment. You know, nothing phases me. Uh, we'll try to to uh, hit F5 on this thing again and see if it deploys with this version. It's probably the version you saw already, but for some reason it didn't work the way it should. Another thing to point out is the I after counter demo interface. Uh, as I said before, you would you would define your actor's interface and then you would implement them um, in your own code. And this interface is sort of the uh, contract for your, uh, your actor, really. So now that we are hopefully doing a, a new deployment, I think we are, we will um, get a new version of our code running here. And it would be really cool And if, if it decided to run using three instances, at least then I will be able to show you. You see the deployment happening there in the, in the background. At least then I would be able to show you uh, this really, really cool um, application when it has multiple, uh, just only says one primary. That is really annoying if you ask me. <laughs> 
but nothing to do. Uh, it's okay. Uh, you still see that I can deploy applications to this thing, and it has code running. Um, if I launch the client application again, uh, I can show you hopefully another thing inside of this this code here, uh, at least. Uh, and it's yeah, something is sort of deploying or doing something with my Visual Studio here because it's not really responding right now. It's this process happening down here. Um, again, this was a little bit in better shape before I reinstalled my system, so I'm going to have to give some feedback to the team now saying that this is not really running. Um, well, maybe, maybe something just happened. I'll give it another go. Be so cool if this works finally, right? No, this does not look good. Ah, da da! Look at that. So now we have what we hopefully have as three running instances of this thing. Uh, let's fire up this client thing again to talk to this service. The client is calling my my service, and if we're lucky, it'll start counting. Yeah, it does. Okay, so this Visual Studio instance with this application now seems to be running in my local fabric. As you can see, it's counting, and the code is running here on, on these three instances that are being kept in sync. So node 1 is my primary in this instance. Node 1 is my primary. So if we go to node 1 and I say, well, this code thing that's running on node 1, in fact, let's, let's take the entire node 1 and say stop node. Entire node 1 is stopping. And as you can see, this guy continues to count. And there is a bit of a glitch here on my local box when it notices that, whoa, wait a minute, this node is gone, our primary is gone. And hopefully it will still, like this is not, exactly typically how, how a thing called like Bing, Bing Cortana would work. It's just on my local machine right now. Maybe it'll continue to, ah, it just blew up. <laughs> this is a great demo. It's working so well, Magnus. Okay, uh, for some reason that blew up. Uh, I have no idea why. Um, but the point though is, if this would be running, this guy would just go away and a new node would, would take its place and uh, one of node 3 or 5 would become the primary and a new node would take its place. That's really uh, how it's supposed to be working, when it works. I'm not going to spend more time on failing demos. That's just embarrassing, really. All right. But the point still is, uh, usually I can, I, I can set a breakpoint in here and uh, the breakpoint will be hit. Uh, it works, runs on the local machine, and and you can uh, build and, and uh, debug and, and work with your, your uh, service fabric applications on your local box. All right, service fabric failed. That does not look good. Instead, we'll go back to the presentation. That seems to be working a little bit better. All right. So your application or your service is your code and your configuration that you would take and place into an application package, which is the, the sort of the unit of lifetime for your application. When you want to deploy a new one, you would deploy it to Azure or deploy it to your service fabric environment, and the new version would take the place of the old version. And uh, using this approach, you can do rolling upgrades, uh, really, uh, of your application. And that's really, really powerful uh, so that you don't have to think about how do I do a production environment, de production deployment of my service without having any down downtime. Well, that's sort of built into this system. So I, in this case, I have a counter service type and uh, also I have a counter web app package. These are two microservices really that I then uh, define inside of one, uh, one uh, application package and then I can deploy this thing um, and version that independently. All right. 
Let's have a little bit of a look at some of the other subsystems and what the point of these, these guys are. Uh, these are sort of uh, scoped in the um, ALM of this thing, in the application lifecycle management of this, this uh, um, service fabric. When you provision and deploy uh, a lot of microservices, when you upgrade microservices and when you monitor them, and have sort of the insights into the health of them. That's when you use these other subsystems of, of the service. Uh, so they just maintain the instances that are running and uh, make sure that you have the right amount of instances. We remember it when, we, when I showed you some failover earlier, uh, that failover uh, with, with the primaries failing and, and another instance taking its place. That's uh, what this subsystem is all about. And then uh, that will interface with uh, the, the auto-scaling layer or rebooting or re-imaging and repairing actions and those sort of things. Um, and that will also uh, be responsible for your operational insights uh, so that you can do capacity planning and things like that. Um, that's all built in uh, really so you can see how much you are utilizing your services. Uh, a good anecdote or a good reference here is that, I mean, how how high CPU use, utilization do you have on a normal server? On average, a normal server would run about 10% hot or 15% or, or maybe 20 if you're really good. But, but the majority portion of any server running anything, any workload, on average in the world is about, you know, 10, 15% tops. The rest of the server is really idle most of the time. With this sort of system in place, you can run many instances of your uh, many different uh, microservices and you can deploy them on your machines with the primaries and secondaries on different machines overlapping each other effectively utilizing your the power of your, your servers more and you will be able to see how high is my utilization right now. Do I need to add more instances of servers? Do I need to add more compute power into my cluster to handle the load? And I can do uh, then of course auto scaling and those sort of, of, of uh, management operations on this system. And it's really, really great. Just imagine the power that you get from not only being able to uh, auto scale to whatever size of, of uh, power you need, but also to be able to deploy your applications much more densely on your environments so that you will utilize your CPUs and your memories and your disks and stuff much more. <coughs> Something is really wrong with my cluster. Go away. Uh, <laughs> so you can utilize your, your uh, server is much, at a much higher level, that would mean that you would be running um, fewer servers to run more services. And then in the end, that's something that's going to save you money uh, on, on running applications. And it's even, even uh, good for the environment if you want to go that far. So anyway, uh, underneath the covers there, you have this orchestration engine that knows when something fails and can do failover and, and can, can uh, you know, do all those things. Um, good. There is a diagnostics piece in there as well, which uses event tracing for Windows. I don't know if you noticed, but those of you who know what that is and have used event tracing for Windows, uh, you can interact with that, and in fact, that's done right here using a service event source uh, instance here, uh, so that you can you can uh, send your own uh, event source messages uh, into that system and have that mes have those messages collected and and get aggregations on them and and do uh, analysis on on the health and the uh, function of your uh, your services really. Um, so you, you would have your application, your code there, you would have the service fabric runtime, both contributing these event tracing uh, sources. Uh, on your local box, you will see that in the, uh, in the, in, inside of Visual Studio, et cetera. 
as we can see on your local development environment, <coughs> but uh, this would be sent uh, normally using the Windows Azure diagnostics uh, uh, tools over to an Azure table. And this is kind of funny that this is still called Windows Azure, even though most things in Azure are now called Microsoft Azure. But if they change this name, it would not be called WAD, it would actually be called MAD, which is probably why they haven't changed the name of the thing yet. And they might never do. <laughs> anyway, that's, the, that's how this, uh, this would run in Azure is that these event traces would go to the Azure Diagnostics, which would send them to Azure Tables. And then you would do your operational insights on top of that. Uh, then you would have a bunch of instances sending <coughs> telemetry, sending information to your Azure table, and uh, you can aggregate and do a lot of, of nice uh, insights on top of that. All right, so I have... Um, a, um, I'm going to jump in, in, in my slide deck a little bit. I have one thing that I wanted to show you which is sort of not related to Service Fabric, which is why I'm going to jump past that piece now. I, had, I, I skipped a few minutes before. Uh, at this time, I, I would like to stop and see if there are any questions. Uh, there might be but it's kind of narrow than my little window here. I can't really see. see. Marcus, you can, uh, next to the X button, there is like a pop-up uh, button. You can make the window bigger with all the questions. I think there is oh, a... I can button. pop it out, right. Oh. oh, there are a few questions right there. Let me see. Very nice. Um, let's see, let's see. I can only see one um, question right now, but maybe some of the people uh, that are currently still with us have more, so maybe let's wait for them to ask questions. Yeah. Right, right. I have a few uh, sort of summary uh, pieces where I show like where we're we at right now and and, and uh, what's happening with Service Fabric, so, so I, I will show you that. Uh, Uh, did you mean the question there that if the questions are those services running async? Was that the question you were referring to? Yes, that was the question I was referring to. Okay. Yeah, yeah, th that's exactly right. Um, this world is is built in the cloud for the cloud, really. So yes, everything you see in here will be running async. Uh, and it's just the way you're supposed to be building things, really. Uh, that is just, there's no other option <coughs> in this world. Everything is async and await, and uh, um, really, uh, this is not because you're, you're supposed to be waiting for a really long time. No, this is because you are supposed to have async control of, of uh, requests coming into your service, for instance, and, and responses going out, etc. And And you have your uh, option to cancel stuff, for instance. Uh, you can cancel your code running at any time. So this really is an async world. It really is. Uh, you have to run async and await uh, and, and code asynchronously when you do uh, service fabric services. So yes, that's async. Um, any more questions, additional questions? Uh, right now, I don't see any new questions. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I will. I will jump over to um, the next slide here that shows where we're at right now. You can build code using uh, C++ and C# -sharp right now, and uh, you can run on Windows servers. And you have this sort of container story. Uh, that you saw with this this cluster that I showed you in the Service Fa Fabric Explorer there, um, that has this this cluster technique. Now I haven't showed you any any Azure yet, so I'm going to show you that as well right now, and I'm going to show you a powerful feature in Azure, uh, which is really good. <clears throat> as you can see, I have this local cluster here on my local box, but I also have a 
demo fabric in Azure. Uh, what do I have up there in Azure? Well, I don't have any applications running, but I do have nodes. These are five virtual machines running in Azure right now, running the service fabric. Five, in fact, five Windows servers are running in Azure right now, not doing anything at all, <laughs> just hanging out um, for me to show you guys. And what I wanted to show you here is, except these service messages that this stuff is not working properly, I wanted to show you this, and I wanted to compare it to this. I showed you this before. Let's see if this even works at all now. My service fabric is dying on me on my local machine. I don't know if everything is running on my local machine at all, but in the cloud anyway, you can see that these uh, services that are running in the cloud are the same ones, except for, in fact, an upgrade service, but are the same ones, and not only are they the same ones, it is the same code, really, that is running on your local box, the same code running in Azure uh, when you deploy to, to, uh, to uh, uh, machines in Azure, and these virtual machines are running that very same code, uh, the very same service fabric code, and when I deploy my applications here instead, well, they're going to run just as they, well, hopefully better than, uh, than they did on my local machine. So if I go to the Azure portal, uh, I have my account activated for Service Fabric and everything, so I can I can look at the Service Fabric. Uh, I can do, go and say, I go to the marketplace and uh, do a Service Fabric. I can create myself a Service Fabric cluster. Uh, I'm not going to do it right now, and it takes a bit of time to deploy these five virtual machines. But as you can see here, I can go in and, and uh, you know, where is where am I supposed to deploy this thing? What type of node uh, do I want them to be? Well, I want them to be virtual machines. Of uh, what size do I want these virtual machines to be? Um, how should they be named? Uh, how many should my cluster contain? And so on and so forth. I can go and create myself a cluster, and being a good chef, I created, of course, a cluster uh, before this session, as you have seen, and so when I go and click my service fabric clusters, I have one such service fabric cluster. Um, and as you can see, this thing has five nodes, the names of the nodes, they are all okay, they're all running, and they're all live up in Azure, and this is the same as this view that I'm seeing here inside of my Service Fabric Explorer. It's really, really cool that I can do this, and uh, I am so looking forward to when deployment to this is more intuitive than it is now. Right now I need to package stuff, and then I need to run, I need to deploy using PowerShell and things like that. It's not at all convenient like the, cl the cloud services, or uh, your, your um, web apps, for instance, your app services. It's not convenient and, and easy like that, but you can still see that I'm running a cluster. I'm running a real cluster of machines in my Azure accounts. And in fact, right now I'm paying for five virtual machines running in my, in my, uh, uh, in my cluster. And one really cool thing uh, when you're using a public cloud is that you can do stuff like this. Uh, everything that I have is running inside of a resource group as part of this create uh, it created the virtual machines and some some uh, vnet controllers and things like that things I don't really have to understand everything about but what I can do is since everything is inside of one big resource group I can also delete them <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and do that right now uh, Magnus demo fabric uh, I can go and delete these five VMs that are costing me actual money at this point um, and remove everything. In, in fact, remove my entire cluster. At this time, I better, you know, have a, a backup of my data. But, <laughs> but I just wanted to show you that, yes, indeed, I'm running Azure. Uh, I'm running a cluster in Azure. And uh, if deployments would have been easier to do, um, perhaps this is a follow-up session. I can show you how to do deployments, but it takes a bit of time, and it's a bit—it's a—it's a little messy right now during 
preview, I want to be clear, this is not the way it's supposed to be looking when it's done. But again, if we go back to the slides, this is running um, these, these sort of containers or, or whatever that is uh, that's running the fabric in Azure right now, uh, running these nodes. Uh, the future is to run in sort of a con other container technology. Uh, I don't know if they're, they're I'm, they might be thinking about running Docker, I, I really can't tell, but it would make a lot of sense if they ran, you know, you could run your, your uh, Docker containers and you could run your fabric inside of these containers. Um, you could run them on Linux, you could run them on Windows, and it really doesn't matter because the service fabric doesn't care. It'll just run on whatever cluster of virtual machines you point it at, and you can just run your apps and, and build your apps completely agnostic of where they're running, really. So it's it's a, a lot interesting uh, the future of these uh, these uh, services or of, of the service fabric. Um, I don't know the exact timeline of things, and uh, the parts that I do know I probably can't tell you anyway. Um, you know I I'm hoping um, this is not a Microsoft person saying or promising anything, and I'm not disclosing any NDA material either. I'm hoping that they will have something out there in production in th within this year. Uh, it's in preview now, and um, it's it's progressing nicely. I'm following Service Fabric, and I see that they have progress. I just don't know exactly how much they want to have out there before it's it's production worthy. Uh, we'll see. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I have a sec I have a question. Um, right. Thank you, uh, Carlo, for saying goodbye to me. Uh, uh, one more person before I had to leave uh, saying that this this was a nice presentation. I uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> I wish my demos would have been a little bit more functional for you. Anyway, uh, there's a, a question here from Einat, if that's how you pronounce your name. Um, when we have two services, which uh, depends on the business, how can we know if they are, who is first, if they are a sync? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand fully the question there. MS slash service fabric, and this is case sensitive, I think. It's big S, big F. Um, to um, see the um, more about the service fabric. What you can do also, also do is you can go and download the um, samples and the SDK in the samples and play with them and install them on your local box like I did. Like, if you're only running on your local machine, it's not going to cost you anything to try this out. And uh, there are tutorials and videos that you can watch. And uh, if you want to try the preview service in the cloud, you need to go to this link at the bottom there, aka.ms slash sfp-external, and register in a form <coughs> which will, uh, in due time, activate an Azure subscription for Service Fabric so that you will be allowed to use Azure Service Fabrics on your, on your Azure subscription the way I showed you just now. So there really is uh, no hindrance here. You can go and play with the stuff that's there and start to get to know it if you want to. What we have seen today, I've been going for, oh, it's actually well, it's, it's a long time. <laughs> I'm going to start to wrap up uh, real quick because this is the actual end. I'm, I've always ha almost had a full time um, uh, of this presentation uh, according to the schedule just a few minutes in the beginning there. Um, so we've talked about the microservices. We've talked about the stateful and stateless technology that you can just run your things uh, in, in using these very powerful APIs. You can create your applications and you can, you can store your state in your instances. You can run stateless applications if you will, if you want to. Um, and then uh, you can scale this out and, and, and just deploy this in, in a replicated, safe environment that will never, you know, fail uh, so bad that it will lose your state, it will not lose your data. I mean, that's how the, the SQL database service uh, that Microsoft runs works, and that's how data, document database 
interface works. And that's how Cortana runs in Azure. It's running on this service fabric. So it really is uh, a super powerful technology that I urge you to start looking into. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm enjoying it myself. And um, I've also enjoyed this presentation. Um, I'm sorry again for the uh, introduction, which was a little bit strange on the te technical side. Uh, if there are any final questions,